Um, it is 3.06 p.m. and I call this uh, meeting of the Senate Elections Committee to order and we do have a quorum. We have three bills on our agenda today and the first bill that will be up is Senate File 1362. Uh, this is going to be presented by Senator Carlson. Good afternoon, Senator Carlson. I understand that you have an author's amendment, is that correct? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, I have uh, the A3 author's amendment. Very good. And I'd this is I'd an like author's amendment. Thank you, uh, Senator Carlson. So, all those in favor of the author's amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The motion is adopted, and the A3. Three, amendment is adopted. All right, Senator Carlson, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is really a, a very, very, very simple technical bill. It just changes some terminology that uh, needed to be adjusted. And uh, um, it is, uh, um, it's brought to me by Senate Council, and it updates just the names of some envelopes that were used in ab the absentee balloting process to reflect how they were named in rules and in the absentee ballot instructions that were sent to voters. Uh, they, were, they were used, uh, the words were, to refer to them were used uh, a little bit, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, inconsistent. And so what this does is it, uh, it is a, um, a correction bill. And uh, I just, there isn't, there isn't anything really other to say with it except I think we do have an amendment from Senator Coran. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carlson. And Senator Coran, I understand that you have an amendment to Senator Carlson's um, bill. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. We have the A4 amendment. Thank you. And... Uh, my understanding is that you have um, spoken with Senator Carlson about the amendment. Is that correct, Senator? We've, Madam Chair, yes. The, it's a it's a bill that's been worked upon, worked on, or an amendment that's been worked on um, with the um, um, I think the counties and, and everybody that's involved in elections. And what it does is it clarifies. If everybody's got a copy of it yet. Um, it really works on the notifications around sample balloting and makes it, and, and there's, uh, there's peace in the valley from, from the cities and the counties as, and as well as the uh, newspaper industry and it provides them with the ability to modernize, at least takes a swing at it. It doesn't correct everything, but it takes a swing at modernizing and the accessibility of sample ballots and notification of elections. and. Uh, and that's really what that what the amendment does. So we have agreement across the board and bipartisan support. Thank you, Senator Cran. Uh, Senator Carlson, um, you view this as a friendly amendment. Madam Chair, yes, I do. I want to thank Senator Cran for doing this. Uh, I know that he had carried this uh, language before, so this is something that uh, it needed to be done, and it, we're uh, we're correcting the record now. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Rust. You, um, Madam Chair, Senator Coran, would you explain the um, the amendment um, so, um, section by section? That would be very helpful yeah, that, to me. The, the Madam Chair, we we uh, we might have to have staff do that, but the, I'll go over the primary the primary elements of um, that cover the high le high level pieces of it. But it's really about the sample ballot um, in the local newspapers and record. Um, Unfortunately, today, um, the way the standards are, it's really expensive and it doesn't reach, um, you know, many, many of the, uh, of the people of the targeted audience and it hasn't modernized it. And it really just seeks to create a design of a new publication notice that provides voters with really useful information and, and so it doesn't lead to confusing ballots or, or confusing ballot postings of getting the right ballot for the right district as they're posted. And then, um, let's see, I'm just looking through the so, crib Madam notes. Chair, Senator Coran, so which section is that? Matt, um, Senator Coran. 
Madam Chair, I think if uh, we could have the council go through the, the specific changes um, it, from a detailed perspective. Um, and then the only other thing from an original version of this bill, Senator Rest, is that it's also moved back the, the effective date to uh, December 1st, 2023, if somebody had seen a previous version. Thank so, you, Senator Kren. So, Madam Chair, so we, if Senate Council or somebody who has read this yeah. would explain it section by section and things like if there's a change in an effective date, why? I mean, and is it just updating it or what? Um, I don't think I probably have any objection to it, but I don't want to. I don't want to vote on words that I haven't seen or had explained. Thank you, Senator Rest. And actually, uh, Mr. Hilgart, I understand that you may be an able to answer some of Senator Rest's uh, questions. So, if you could identify yourself for our record, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Matt Hilgart. I work with the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I want to apologize to the committee too because. You might be asking, where did this come from? <laughs> and um, we do agree with Senator Coran that this is a, a, a bipartisan, hopefully non-controversial amendment. Um, and what this is really doing, Senator Rest, is, is basically saying right now we have a current mandate to post a, a sample ballot in the newspaper of record. However, what we are seeing, and we've all acknowledged, is that the folks that are reading their newspapers might be seeing ballots that don't actually represent what they'll be seeing in their polling places. So that is something we've been trying to fix this last year, section by section. This is basically designating the Secretary of State to coordinate a working group with um, members from the Association of Minnesota Counties, county officers, Secretary of State's office, as well as the Newspaper Association. Uh, every, again, everyone is on board. Sure they'll be responsible for dictating what the new notification will be. So, Madam Chair, my question is, Senator Rest. What, is what is Section 9 and why? What is, what is the language of Section 10 and why? There's a lot of la new language in Section 11. Please explain it. Not the, not the generalities for why it's here, but tell us what the language is and what it does. Sure. Please, and I don't mean to be irritable, but um, people coming and say this is a good bill, vote for it. Uh, that that's not good enough. Senator Rest. Also, I I believe um, Council can go through the bill and is happy to do that. Somebody. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. So, looking at the A4 amendment, these are several additional sections that are added to the end of Senator Carlson's DE amendment. Um, starting with Section 9, there's a current law that requires the Secretary of State to develop procedures to allocate the election expenses. The substance of that is not changed, but you'll see on line 1.10, there is a reference to sample ballots. Um, and the bill no longer requires sample ballots, but instead requires a published notice with information. So it's changing sample ballots to re reference the newly required notice that um, is on the next page. Section 10 is another um, change talking about getting rid of the sample ballot um, and referring again to the newly created notice. So there's creating uniformity and directing everything into the newly created section. If you flip the page on page two, section 11, this is the notice provision um, that the other sections are all referencing. So it requires uh, county auditors to publish this notice um, between 15 and 10 or between 20 and 10 days before a general election and it requires the Secretary of State to work with stakeholders including local government election officials and representatives of the Minnesota Newspapers Association to work together to, to design this notice that will be published and that working group include has to work on the format and the content to be used Again, the Secretary of State and the stakeholders can modify that content um, for use by metropolitan counties. And then you'll see starting on line 15, there are all of the requirements that must be in this notice, including information about um, where, to, where to view, the website where you can view who's actually on your ballot, um, to where you can find sample ballots, how to obtain a free copy of a sample ballot, and those sorts of information so voters know where to find the exact ballot that they will be voting on that day. On page three, section 12 is another change, um, deleting sample ballot and referencing the newly created publication notice. 
And the same thing in section 13, deleting a reference to the sample ballot and inserting a cross-reference to that newly created notice. And finally, on the last page, section 14 is another example of striking sample ballot and cross-referencing back to that notice. And the effective date is uh, December 1st of this year, um, or if the Secretary of State and the working group get things done earlier, they can notify um, the revisor's office, in which case um, the effective date is earlier than December 1st. Senator Rest. As we've seen in um, some other um, references to technology, a term like web address and website and um, is there a more, Mr. Hilgard, uh, a less kind of jargony thing, expression, that um, uh, where um, the, this could, this provision could last more than two years before it's obsolete? Um, and what about people who don't have um, a um, access to the web? How, how do they find out? Mr. Hilgart. Um, In the newspaper someplace? Or where do they find out? Madam Chair and Senator Rest, uh, to your first question, I would defer to counsel on what their expertise and suggestions might be to use verbiage that would be as, as um, timeless as possible. Uh, on the second one, this still requires a newspaper notification. Um, and what we have done is actually expand the mandate for government to give certain information. Um, and our intent here is to make sure that if someone does, if the, if the website address is not sufficient enough for the person who's seen this in their newspaper, they say, I don't have a computer. The point is, I, for, on, on line, I believe it is uh, 2.24, Madam Chair, um, that it gives contact information, real contact information, not just website contact information, for the election administrator that will be responsible for sending a sample ballot free of charge to that citizen so that they can see it. Well, um, Madam Chair, and I'm Senator Senator Rest. Um, um, I really appreciate that. And if the amendment had been gone through in that way to start with, you wouldn't have my questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Mr. Hilker, and I support the amendment. Senator Limmer. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, first, I want to thank Senator Rest for raising that question. Uh, and the reason is, is over the last few years, You're the only one. We seem to be losing our discipline in the Senate, and we describe amendments, but we don't, or uh, amendments or bills, but we don't explain them uh, thoroughly. Uh, we describe them, and uh, I think we have to get back to that, that practice. Um, having said that, uh, I do have a question on the A4 amendment, and that brings us to page two, um, lines 11 through, well, actually lines 2.13 to 2.14. Uh, where it says, when published, the notice must be sized so it comprises a minimum of one full newspaper page. Yeah, what is that? Um, could I ask, who pays for that uh, page of printing? Mr. Hilgard. Madam Chair, Senator Lemaire, that's a good question. Um, that would be the local government who pays for that. Currently, we do pay for the postage of the sample ballot, which might take up that or more. Um, and so this was an agreement that we had with the Minnesota Newspaper Association to make sure, this was a Senator Kiffmeyer request from last year, that those local newspapers weren't disproportionately impacted financially from that size of posting changing. Um, so this is um, a provision that was supported by the Minnesota Newspaper Association. And Madam Chair. Um, Senator Limmer. Uh, have we gotten any response from local cities uh, on the new bill that they're going to pay for? Are they in favor of that? Mr. Hilligard. Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, um, the cities will be coming down, but this is not a new bill because it's, right now we still have the duty to pay for the postage of the sample ballot. So this will be replacing that sample ballot. If anything, it will be equal or potentially less of a charge. But um, Ms. Hassel might be able to speak on behalf of cities. Can you identify yourself for the record? Go ahead. 
Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Alex Hassel. I'm here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, this is something that the cities also support. We do have some requirements currently as well for these publication uh, sample ballots, and so we do see this as something that would improve efficiency for that. And one other question. Senator Limmer. Uh, on line 212, um, and this is more for the author, um, where it says Secretary of State in collaboration with stakeholders. Who, could you identify who the stakeholders may be? Madam Chair. Um, Senator Limmer, um, the author was actually Senator Coran. Would you like, are you addressing your question to him or your, to our testifiers? Well, it seems like the uh, chief author and the author of the amendment are working on this together, so I don't really care who gives me the answer. Okay. Who would like to take this? No, Madam Chair, Senator, Senator Limmer, uh, the definition of stakeholder is on 2.29. Um, for the purpose of this section, stakeholders means the local mm -hmm. government election officials and representatives of Minnesota Newspaper Association. All right. Uh, one, one further Senator question. Uh, on lines 2.27, the word polling place locations, is polling printed that way? Is that correct? No, it's With one L? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Since this is Senator Coran's amendment, I'm assuming he's the responsible party. <laughs> Senator Coran. Madam Chair and, and Senator Lemmer, we'll have to defer that to the, uh, to the uh, reviser's office. And Ms. Stangle, you want to give us a proper spelling? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, or Madam Chair and members, if somebody's looking to amend this online at 2.27, delete the word P-O-L-I-N-G and replace it with polling P-O-L-L-I-N-G. M Madam Chair, I'd like to make that oral amendment to line 2.27 to uh, remove the word P-O-L-I-N-G uh, and replace it with P-O-L-L-I-N-G. Thank you, Senator Coran. We have an oral amendment to the amendment. I assume we have no discussion on this. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <laughs> the amendment has been amended. Is there any further discussion on the A4 amendment? All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right. The amendment is adopted. Um, so now we move on to the bill as adopted by the A4 uh, amendment. Um, any further discussion? All right, seeing none, um, Senator Carlson uh, renews his motion to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. All right, Senator Carlson has another bill before us. This is uh, Senate file 1943. And again, I see that we have an author's amendment. Um, Senator. Carlson, do you want to move the A1 author's amendment? Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A1 author's amendment to right. uh, Senate file 1943. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, members, this is a campaign finance board's campaign finance policy bill. And uh, it is, uh, it's an agency bill, so I would like to have Mr. Sigurdsson uh, walk through the bill and uh, explain the, the changes that are within it. Mr. Sigurdsson, when you get settled in, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members, my name is Jeff Sigurdsson. I'm the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. As Senator Carlson said, this is the uh, policy recommendations uh, from the board dealing with campaign finance. There are separate bills for the economic interest statement program and for the lobbying program, but this is the campaign finance portion of those recommendations. 
Um, because of the uh, delete, or excuse me, of the auditors, excuse me, the author's amendment, um, if, as we go through the bill, you'll be able to first go to page three, line 3.21, uh, as section one was deleted by the author's amendment. This is dealing with the, um, the procedure used by the board in investigating uh, complaints that are filed with it against uh, candidates, political committees, and party units. The process set up by the legislature is very much um, set up to protect the rights of the individual or a committee that's um, the, the subject of the complaint and has three distinct processes. The first is a, a prima facie determination, which is done by the board chair uh, within 10 business days, which basically says, okay, is this even within the board's jurisdiction? as we often receive complaints dealing with local candidates or occasionally federal candidates. And then secondly, is the complaint backed up with at least some level of, of, um, of evidence? It doesn't have to be proven at the prima facie, but it can't be purely speculation. The second stage is the stage uh, that we're asking for an amendment. Um, it's called probable cause, and it's the first time that the complaint is evaluated by the full board. Um, it's also the first time that the entity that uh, is the subject of the complaint has a chance to respond to the complaint, provide evidence to the uh, to staff showing why the complaint doesn't need to be investigated, why it's not uh, based, uh, uh, while it's simply not valid. And as provided in statute, that needs to be done within 45 days. In practice, it is rarely done within 45 days. Often the uh, association or individual who's facing the complaint needs more time to get bank records or other evidence that will show that the complaint doesn't need to go forward. In some more serious cases, they wish to hire a counsel, and almost invariably if they hire a counsel, counsel needs to have time to also review the complaint and the evidence available. So again, in practice, um, it almost always takes 60 days and so on line 3.21, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's where it starts, but on line uh, 4.20, we're changing 45 days to 60 days to, um, uh, to uh, issue the probable uh, cause determination. There is also um, on line 4.35, there is, once we get into the uh, investigation stage, which is the third stage of probable cause is found, which was more likely than not that a violation occurred, then the board opens a formal investigation. Um, in some cases, again, because of the reasons I stated, we need to get records, we need to put people, um, uh, we need to conduct depositions. Uh, it can't be done within 60 days. And to make sure that we have a full investigation, the board has authority to uh, extend the, the time frame. Uh, that's in current statute. This is clarifying the language to apply it to the probable cause. Uh, determination as well. Um, and Madam Chair, I'm not sure what your preference is. Would you prefer that I take questions after every section or or go through the entire bill first, whichever is uh, easier for you? Thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson. I think the first we'll um, ask uh, members if anyone has any amendments to the... Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Um, I suppose it might make sense to take questions as we go through. That's fine. Senator Rest. The change, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Sigurdsson, the change um, in under D uh, to 60 days um, and then, uh, is that just matching? Um, Section E, which already has 60 days, I'm trying to uh, find the difference. And, and I, I think you said that if the section part, if, um, if they need more than 60 days, how do they get it under this bill? Mr. Sigurdsson. Madam Chair, Senator Rest, 
Uh, the section D is dealing with the probable cause determination. That's the second stage where, for the first time, the board evaluates the response from the individual who's being complained against or is facing a complaint. So that's moving it to 60 days. It already says 60 days for the findings. Uh, if there is probable cause, then you go to findings. The, the language they're extending it is basically, um, uh, when I say extending, uh, providing authority to the board to extend an investigation beyond 60 days is based either on a staff request, and sometimes we simply can't get the records that you need to complete the investigation. And then sometimes it's, it's another uh, request for an extension by the individual facing the complaint. Thank you, M M Madam Chair, Mr. Senator uh, Rest. Senator, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. If there aren't any other questions, uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, you could continue. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, section 3, uh, which starts on line 5.4, um, is, I think, just closing, a, a, frankly, a, a, a bill drafting oversight or drafting error. A little bit of background. Uh, independent expenditure committees and funds and ballot question committees and funds, which are uh, committees that can spend money on constitutional amendments, those committees can take corporate contributions. And because they can take corporate contributions, they are then prohibited from making a contribution directly to a candidate. Unlike a regular political committee or fund, which uh, receives its funding from other sources, they can both make independent expenditures and, and candidate contributions. The problem is, is that the penalty for an independent expenditure committee that took corporate funds and then made a contribution to a candidate applies only to an independent expenditure committee or fund. They forgot to include, or the language was forgotten, for ballot question committees or funds, which again can take corporate contributions. So this is just sort of filling a little bit of a hole to, to provide that the penalty uh, for making a contribution, if you've received corporate contributions to a candidate, um, extends to ballot question committees and funds too. I will say that this is um, at least, um, no, I'm sure it's a, true, it's a true statement. This has never occurred, but we just want to fill the gap before we're facing that situation. Any questions regarding the section? Okay, continue, Mr. Sigurdsson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Section four, which starts on line 5.16, this is, this is one of two provisions that it's trying to clean up language a little bit in terms of the board's um, uh, support of Hennepin County candidates and ballot questions. Uh, committee members may recall that starting this year, um, committees that wish to have expenditures or make independent expenditures or make contributions to influence elections, certain elections in Hennepin County, whether it be countywide, the city of Minneapolis, um, all, any city in Minneapolis, excuse me, any city in Hennepin County with a population of over 75,000, that has to be reported by the committees and funds that are registered with the board. Um, currently, the statute provides to help the treasurers of the candidates that receive contributions from party units and political committees registered with the board. There is a requirement that you identify the uh, the registration number on the check or include it with a letter uh, that the check, uh, that the candidate receives. This helps the, the volunteer treasurer figure out if it's a lobbyist contribution, you know, if it should be reported as coming from a committee or a fund, and it doesn't extend currently to those Hennepin County candidates. So just to help out those candidates, we're extending that requirement to provide the registration number to those candidates as well. Any questions regarding this section? Madam Chair? Yes. Senator Coran. Thank you. Oh, sorry, you're not on section, you didn't go to subdivision eight yet. Um, sorry, I jumped the gun. Okay. I have a question when you get there, Mr. Sigurdsson. All right, sir. Sorry. Good. Continue, Mr. Sigurdsson. Uh, the next section is um, section four, which starts on line 5.16. This is looking at virtual currency, bitcoins, um, cryptocurrency, all those terms work. Basically, Chapter 10 simply doesn't provide any guidance on what happens if your committee or party unit or political committee receives a contribution in Bitcoin. Um, staff has been basically stretching and saying that, well, we will view it as an in-kind contribution because an in-kind contribution is anything of value other than U.S. currency. But frankly, there are problems in doing that, how to report it, how to report it in and out. And so what this is trying to do is update Chapter 10A to deal with, uh, with virtual currency. 
it provides that number one, and this is important, that you can receive a contribution through Bitcoin or, or that type of currency. But because of how volatile it is, uh, the requirement is that within five business days, you convert the Bitcoin um, into US currency and deposit it into the bank account for your committee. Um, further, any expenditure that your committee makes has to be through that bank account. It can't be with the Bitcoin. So in other words, you can't receive a Bitcoin and turn around and make an expenditure for your committee. That's important to the board because we do have the authority to conduct audits of a campaign committee if we believe funds are being used inappropriately. But if contributions aren't going into that bank account or expenditures aren't being made out of that bank account, then we no longer have the ability to conduct a full audit. And so we wish to make sure that funds from, a, from that type of uh, contribution get into the account. It also has two other provisions. Number one, we believe that the contribution value is the amount that the individual gave you at the time that the donation was made, which is, I guess, a long way of saying, if they gave you a $1,000 Bitcoin contribution, that's the maximum contribution amount on that day. That's what they intended to do, was give you the maximum contribution. If it, for example, because it's a volatile type of currency, if it goes up to $1,200, within that five days, does that mean that you've now accepted a prohibited contribution or at least a $200 excess contribution? And the answer is no, we don't believe that that's what the donor uh, intended. And so instead we treat that additional $200 that may have grown in value as miscellaneous income, which does not count as a contribution. It still has to be reported, it's still shown going into your committee, but it doesn't count against the contribution limit of somebody who, when they made the contribution, believed they were only giving you $1,000. Similarly, if it loses value and now it's worth 750, that isn't going to create another gap where the individual can now give you another 250. Instead, we say it's a $1,000 contribution, but instead you have a $250 expenditure to, uh, to account for the fact that the currency or the Bitcoin lost value before you were able to deposit it. Um, this allows, again, the, the reports that your treasurer file to balance, the, the money in and the money out is going to balance, uh, and it also allows us to, again, as I said, conduct audits of, of the activity uh, within the committee's account. Senator Coran, did you, oh, Senator Rest? So, um, where is the responsibility for finding out that that Bitcoin contribution increased in value within five days? Who, who, who's supposed to know that? The treasurer or the donor? And Mr. does the donor then have to uh, tell the campaign committee or the, or the candidate that it went up $250? Was Mr. that... Is that part of, of this discussion here in, the, in this amendment? Where is that language? Who's responsible? Mr. Sigurdsson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rest, remember the Bitcoin is then given to the treasurer. So the treasurer knows that on this date it's worth $1,000. If when the, at the time they convert it to U.S. currency it's now worth, let's say, $1,200, they're the ones that know that it, it's an additional $200, and they're the ones that would put that $200 in as miscellaneous income. So the responsibility is with the treasurer. The treasurer. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Wow. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, we had, I, th I think it's good to acknowledge, right, we've got the evolution of, of transfer of uh, currencies. And we had a conversation. I do think, I guess, Madam Chair, what's the path? Is this just being laid over for inclusion, or is this going to the floor? Uh, this is going to judiciary. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, so I, I think is this is a good cleanup bill or a policy bill. I think that's probably a point, or this would be the perfect time to address kind of the cash apps or the Zelle application or, you know, um, payment methodologies. And so I, I think it's clear in the statute that all funds must run through a primary account. But with the emergence of cash app and those types of apps where um, somebody can receive small donor, small dollar donors or, or any, uh, denomination donations, uh, and they sit in a holding account either outside or unassociated with the primary account, 
I think it's probably an opportunity to clarify how that should work if and when those apps are, are tied to a campaign account, that they should probably make sure that all of those dollars move back through that account because there's a holding there's a holding pool that they can take money in and out and disperse it as well and without ever touching a primary account because they're withheld in, in, in a separate third party. It's tied to an account but doesn't necessarily flow through a primary bank account for all transactions. And so I think it's worthwhile that we look at that scenario where it's tied to a primary account, one that's registered with you, and those that are not, and if they're not, and, well, if they're not, are they allowed or prohibitive? And we probably should consider that type of uh, modification or clarity um, in this particular bill as it moves forward. Mr. Sigurdsson. Madam Chair, Senator Cran, uh, yes, sir, you and I did have a discussion about that, and frankly, I agree. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't have personal knowledge on many of the applications, but we, the, the staff did look at Venmo at the last election because we did have a couple of candidates wondering when they go door knocking, sometimes people will yeah. say, you know, I'd like to give you $10, but, you know, I don't have a check. Do you have Venmo? Um, and, and from our research, Venmo can be attached to whatever uh, uh, account you want. It doesn't have to be a personal account. It can be a quote-unquote business account, which in this case is going to be the committee's account. Um, and, and so we didn't see a, a problem with that because, frankly, in, in theory at least, or uh, not in theory, but in practice, it works much like when you receive a contribution over a website. When you receive a contribution either Act Blue or Red State, for a moment, that's not in your account, that's in their account, and then periodically they transfer it to you. So from our standpoint, it's just a mechanism to move money into your account. However, uh, I believe you pointed out to me that in some of those applications, it's possible to make expenditures out, and, and that, frankly, I do find alarming. Um, uh, so I, I have no problem with that, sir. If, if there's an opportunity here to either clarify the language here, there is also a provision um, not in front of you that talks about uh, the timing of bringing down contributions from a website to make sure that the, they're included on the report. I think that might be another place we could look at. but. Um, I would certainly be uh, open to working with you on an amendment to deal with that situation. Yeah. Madam Chair. Senator Craig. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll work with you to see if we can figure out that lane. One, the clarification, just so it's clear. I think that that is a growing opportunity. And it's clear, I think it's, a, it's more clear when that account is tied to your registered f account and then the consideration, should you allow anybody to participate and accept in a, in, a, in a cash app that's not tied to your primary account, and then can you use it for disbursements? And you know, I, I guess those are the things that we have to clarify, but I'll work with you on that, and hopefully we can get an amendment before you move it through the next step, so thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and similarly along those lines, I'm, I'm curious uh, for Mr. Segretson, like, I haven't been asked yet in my seven years and three campaigns to uh, uh, if someone could give me a donation in Bitcoin, but I'm sure with the growth of these types of currencies, I'm sure that day is coming at some point. And so what does that practically look like from a candidate standpoint? Is it setting up a campaign Coinbase account or crypto.com or whatever the, the company or mechanism that you use or is there and kind of tied to what Senator Cran was bringing up with the, with the growing number of other finance and cash apps and accounts and such you can attach to them. Are there requirements that they have to be set up under the auspices of your campaign rather than a personal one that someone wants to give me that's coming through me and I'm moving it into the campaign fund or anything like that. And then second question related to that is I've dabbled in uh, crypto sales in, in small amounts and there's tax implications every time a transaction is made uh, buying or selling. Is that also going to apply uh, to campaigns uh, is that something that they're going to have to take into consideration, or, or uh, how will some of that work? Mr. Sigurdsson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Matthews, um, 
a couple of good questions. My understanding is the, uh, with the Bitcoin is that you have to set up a quote unquote wallet and that the wallet would be set up for your campaign committee to receive or party unit or political committee to receive the contributions. And from there, it's directed into your personal account. That's my understanding. The, the second on the tax implications, uh, I must confess I don't know. Uh, I do know that um, the IRS has, uh, by, by their regulation, doesn't view a campaign committee as a taxable entity. So any of the proceeds that you receive, either through donations or through the sale of items, is not taxable. Um, so I'm not sure if that would be if that would be covered, but that would be something that we could look into. And quick follow-up. Uh, then can you clarify? Did I understand you right that a campaign uh, cannot a campaign can only receive a contribution in Bitcoin? They cannot acquire Bitcoin value, like hope to take you know catch it on the way up with the swings up or down or something, increase the funds. Is that is that going to be in the policy that, uh, that the Bitcoin can only come incoming uh, and not something that a campaign can go out and acquire? Mr. Sigurdsson. Madam Chair, Senator, I don't believe they could do that under current statute. Uh, okay. uh, chapter 211B12 talks about the things that you can do with contributions received for a political purpose, and investments is simply not listed. So I don't believe that would be, there would be an option to invest in the stock market or in bitcoins or anything else. Um, uh, the board has um, viewed a, a certificate of deposit or a savings account through a bank as, as somewhat different, but certainly speculative things where you don't have a, a set uh, a rate of return um, it, it is not something that 211B12 would, would, uh, would condone. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this section? Mr. Sigerson, you can continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Section six, which starts on line 6.4, um, this is also looking at the Hennepin County disclosure that the board is now responsible for. Again, um, this is committees and, and party units which wish, with, with which uh, to make a contribution to one of the Hennepin County candidates um, covered by this provision. Now that usually occurs, for example, Minneapolis holds its elections during odd numbered years. So there's a separate schedule set up for the reports that must be filed. Basically, they must file, uh, I believe it's five reports, one of which, uh, perhaps the most important, at least uh, typically for, for committees, is the pre-primary report. While not all cities have primary elections, whether it because of ranked choice voting or because they simply don't have a primary election, uh, that date then doesn't work, uh, or at least in the current language, that would imply that a report doesn't have to be filed. This is changing it, saying that regardless of whether or not the city has a primary election, a report is still due based on the primary date uh, set up in, in Chapter 205, which is 15 days before the second Tuesday in August. They'll have to file a pre-primary report. Again, this is just closing a gap so that some cities you have to file a pre-primary report and others you don't. In this case, in all cases, you have to file a pre-primary report. I don't see any questions, so I think you can continue. Okay. Uh, the next is section seven, which starts on line 6.27. Um, you may recall that if a political committee, candidates committee, party unit is selling uh, goods or services, then the proceeds from that sale is in fact a contribution to the political committee, candidate, or party unit. The question is, is then should there be some notification to the individuals who are buying those goods or services that a contribution has occurred? And the statute provides is, is the answer is yes. You must provide a uh, written notification or you can do it verbally, but typically it's gonna be a written notification that the, uh, the proceeds from the sale are gonna be a contribution. Um, the current language says that that notice has to be in immediate proximity to the point of sale. Well, immediate proximity is something that can be interpreted in different ways by different people. So the board is trying to simplify this and just says within three feet. Everybody can agree within, within what within three feet means. The second part of the verbiage that you see there starting in line um, 7.4, we're also trying to provide some information on what if you're selling the items over a website. 
how, how do you provide the notice in that case? So this is just providing clarification as to where the notice uh, is provided, but it's not a new requirement. Any questions? Please continue. Section 8, which starts on line 7.8. Um, oh, this is, to step back for a moment, um, candidates are aware that there are contributions from party units and, and that party units can make independent expenditures on a candidate's behalf as well. But there's a third category, the multi-candidate political party expenditure, which doesn't have to be independent of the candidate, but it has to benefit three or more candidates. The most common one that you're probably familiar with is the official sample ballot of the party, where you'll see three or more candidates listed as being the endorsed candidate for the party. You can cooperate with that, it's, but it's still not going to be a donation to your committee. It's not reported by your uh, committee as a donation. It doesn't count against the, uh, the maximum party contributions that you can receive during the year. Uh, the, the board has come up with this, um, I guess with the question uh, through a complaint saying that, well, right, but that doesn't apply currently to state fair booths or uh, county fair booths or fair booths set up at a community event. And we do see that most, um, I want, at least from my experience, most county fairs have booths set up for the DFL and Republican Party. Currently, the allocation of space at that booth for the literature of their candidates. Here's our candidate for 55B and for Senate District 55 and for governor. That allocation of space showing uh, the literature and providing that literature is in fact under current statute contributions to those candidates. That's kind of on those requirements that um, the requirement is much more than the benefit to the public to try to break that down. I mean, who wants to break down the, the counter space for 16% for this candidate and 21% for this candidate? So it's saying that as long as you have literature for three or more candidates at the booth, we're going to include that in this multi-candidate political party expenditure category. So it doesn't count as a contribution to the candidate. It doesn't have to be allocated by the poor treasurer for the party unit, and it doesn't have to be reported by your uh, treasurer as a contribution coming to your committee. So we're, we're trying to simplify the disclosure requirement by dealing, by I think recognizing that uh, the public expects that a, a, a booth set up by a party unit is in fact there to support their candidates, and, and so there isn't any additional disclosure necessary. Senator Rest. Madam Chair, just a clarification. So this, this is only when there's three or more um, like endorsed candidates of a party, not three or more candidates that may be from here or there uh, uh, and just some group gets together and wants to uh, <clears throat> have a booth that has three who maybe are affiliated with the party but oh, maybe only one is. Um, what happens in that, in that instance? Mr. Sacred Senator. Madam Chair, Senator Rest, um, it's set up so that it's three or more individuals whose names are to appear in the ballot, and we went with individuals who appear in the ballot because that would allow you to also, it's not a requirement that they're endorsed. So I suppose if the, um, if the county fair occurred before the endorsement convention, mm -hmm. or then that would be all right. Uh, but I think typically it's going to be after that that occurs, or at least I think most county fairs are later on in the summer. Um, but it's... And it is only limited to party units, so it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't cover any individual who decides to buy a, a booth and then give it to a candidate. That's still a contribution to the candidate, okay. but for a party unit, it, it, would, uh, it would not be a Thank you, contribution. Manager. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Sigerson, if, if a uh, high school has a business uh, Expo at their high school for uh, kids, and they allow the candidates to come in and put a table up and put their things on there. Is that considered a community event? Mr. Sigurds. <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, um, I, I think then. It could be, and frankly, I think at that point the pressure is on the school district as to whether or not they would want to um, allow that sort of a booth to be set up. Uh, community event is, is not defined. 
I think we were looking more at things like, uh, you know, frankly, I don't know, a Fourth of July event or, or something. Uh, you know, many communities have um, have parades and days around whatever their Founders Day or whatever it may be. Um, a school district, I think, would. I suspect would think twice about letting a political activity in in that scenario, but it would be up to the school district. And just to clarify, Mr. Sigurdsson, if I understood your prior co comment, it would it would only impact a party unit that had a booth at the community event. If it's at the school, it's the party unit. Is that correct? Madam Chair, that's correct. If I didn't understand Senator Anderson's question, I apologize. I, it wouldn't... Um, impact a candidate who had permission to set up a booth, that would still be viewed as a campaign expenditure by the candidate. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Continue, Mr. Sigurdsson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The last provision is uh, Section 9, which starts on line uh, 7.30, although actually the, I should say that's where it starts, but the real language is on line 8.16. Uh, this is the requirement if you... Um, if a candidate signs the public subsidy agreement, uh, they are required to close caption any television advertisement that they have, or if they have a radio advertisement, they have to provide the script of the radio advertisement on their website. Um, however, there's no penalty if they don't. And unfortunately, the board has had complaints um, which found, uh, which after investigation were found to be valid complaints, where candidates simply forgot to do that, um, and, and the penalty would have been appropriate. Uh, the language here, um, and I suppose why this bill is going to judiciary, is it does set a civil penalty of up to $1,000 as imposed by the board. I would say that the board, on a first time violation, is not going to do a $1,000 penalty. I mean, it simply doesn't. That's standard language throughout Chapter 10A, that up to $1,000, the board may have a civil penalty. First time violations, um, it's very, very rare to see that. But nonetheless, some sort of penalty um, the board believes is appropriate. Otherwise, the statute uh, simply has no teeth. Senator Rust. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Mr. Sigurdsson. I'm really pleased to, to see um, um, a penalty being imposed. Um, I was associated with putting this language in uh, in the statute to, um, particularly at the time for um, hearing impaired Minnesotans and their and voters. There's um, uh, generally thought to be 20% of us who are hearing impaired, yeah. um, and that includes um, a lot of voters and. Um, in terms of accessibility for those of us who are hearing impaired, or um, that was very welcomed requirement. But as you pointed out, um, there's probably more instances of it not being obeyed than um, <clears throat> certainly than there are um, uh, complaints about it. Few complaints, lots of instances. So perhaps. Uh, with the addition of a penalty, a consequence for not doing it, other um, uh, campaigns and candidates may um, pay more attention to it, even if um, the maximum penalty that's here is not going to be one that you would impose on, um, on a first-time um, offense. But I really do, um, um, on, on behalf of that 20%, that we put into this, and particularly making it subject to, if you accept a public subsidy, you are agreeing to provide closed captioning on campaign materials that are that are on TV or wherever else that people are not just looking at moving lips without having any um, idea what those candidates are talking about. So thank you very much and the board for including this provision. Thank you, Senator Rust. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, are there any amendments for this bill? All right. Um, any further discussion on the bill as, as amended? All right. This is a bill that um, is going to be moving on to judiciary. All those in favor of... Uh, moving the bill forward to judiciary, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The bill passed 
as amended. Now that I've been um, drunk with power, I'm going to have to relinquish it back to Chair Carlson so that I can present my bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Next uh, bill that we have on our program here is uh, Senate File 749, Senator, Senator Westland. And uh, Senator Westland, as soon as you get ranged there, I believe you have an author's amendment. I do, uh, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer the A1 amendment. It is a delete everything amendment. Senator West Westland offers the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will do an introduction, and then um, Ms. Stangel has offered to go through the bill uh, so that we can go through each piece. In essence, this bill is being presented um, to provide randomization of the order of partisan candidates on the ballot. Uh, we already do this for local parties. Um, there is research and evidence to show that there is certainly um, uh, some um, benefit to being the first person listed on the ballot. Um, initially, we had, uh, we had looked at trying to do this for uh, the presidential race and to divide between major party candidates and minor party candidates and um, what was determined is that they just uh, we were not able to do it um, the software for the various voting machines was not able to do it and so basically the delete all amendment keeps the presidential and vice presidential um, ballot order the same and if you will look at lines, um, starting with line 1.12 through 1.17, that is, in essence, the language that is stricken in uh, 1.25 down to 1.30. So it's just relocating the language up to the presidential um, uh, subdivision two, which deals with the presidential ballot. And this specifically deals with um, candidates nominated by petition. So really, the, the only section that we are dealing with today is um, Section 2, uh, which creates Subdivision 2A, that except as provided in um, regarding the presidential and vice presidential candidates, the names of candidates for partisan offices on the state general election will be rotated. Um, and again, uh, part of the reason for doing this is we know that um, those who are listed first on the ballot um, tend to get a little bit of a bump. It can be 2 to 3%, uh, might be a little bit higher than that. But in a close race, that can make an enormous difference. And so uh, we do this already for the uh, nonpartisan races. And so the proposal is then to do this um, for the partisan races as well. I believe Ms. Stangle was going to go through the amendment. Thank you, Senator Westman. Thank you, Senator Westman. We'll have uh, a council walk through the bill to give us a better idea of all the changes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Looking at the A1 amendment, it's a delete all. Uh, section 1 talks about how candidates for president and vice president will be placed on the ballot. 
and as Senator Westland talked about, um, this, the major parties will be placed on the ballot in the same manner they are now, with the party that had received the lowest average votes going at the top and going subsequently the next amount of votes and so forth down, down the ballot. <laughs> then the candidates for president and vice president that were nominated by petition, so the candidates that are not major party candidates, will be placed below the major party candidates and their order is determined by drawing lots. Senator Westland pointed out the language on 1.12 to 1.17 is substantively similar to what is being removed on 1.25 to 1.30. Section 2 is a new is new language, and this talks about all of the other partisan offices, so all the partisan offices that aren't president and vice president, and these will be rotated on the ballot in the same manner as nonpartisan offices, and that's so um, each candidate will appear roughly equally in each spot on the um, ballots throughout the area. So they'll be equally at the top and equally at the bottom and, and all the spots in between. And section three, as I already mentioned, the bulk of this has just been deleted and moved to section one. So what remains is um, how the political party or principle is placed on the ballot for um, non-major party candidates. And Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Stang Stangle. Senator Weston. Yeah, I think that the intent here is, uh, again, to, to try to create um, a system that will um, improve fairness. Um, again, there have been studies to show that your the, the placement of name on a ballot can actually impact the outcome. Um, there are uh, benefits to candidates, um, as I said, between 2 and 3% in some studies um, if for the person who's listed first on the ballot. So the idea is to level the playing field. Everyone will be at the top of the ballot, the middle of the ballot, the bottom of the ballot, an equal number of times um, uh, for ballots in the district. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have uh, Senator Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Westland, um, subdivision three, that's the non-major party candidates. How are they placed on there? Are they in that same rotating, you know, like, or let's just Democrat, Republican, weed now, legalize now, and then the next time it would be Republican, legalize now, weed now, Democrat? Is that that same kind of rotation, or are they underneath the two major parties? How, how, explain to me how that works in that subdivision three, please. So that the Westland. nominees by, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Senator, the, the nominees by petition? Um, I, I don't think that that section actually has changed. Um, I would defer, Ms. Stangle might be able to explain that. Ms. Stangle. Mr. Chair and Senator Barr, if I think, I'll rephrase what I think you're asking and then I'll answer and you can tell me if I've got it wrong. So I think under section two you're asking for um, how partisan offices are rotated on the ballot, excluding president and vice president, if it's all the major parties and minor parties and everybody sort of all rotated all together. Um, if that is your question, the answer is yes, they're all rotated through evenly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Westland, you had mentioned a couple of times about the two to three bump, uh, that the first one in... Do you have a study or some data where you got that? Yeah, there are, um, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick, there are a couple of different studies. Um, there's, there was a study done um, from the University of Ohio. Um, there's, a, and I believe, I can't remember if that's, um, there's a study here from the Oxford Journal. Um, there's something that's been reported in University of Chicago Press as well, and I'd be happy, I can get copies of these if you're interested in them, but in essence, it, the studies do indicate that your placement on the ballot, if it's a static placement, um, does actually impact, at least in some, in some marginal way, uh, but in a close race, that 2 to 3% could make a difference. Follow sure. up, Senator Jordan? Uh, no, thank you for that. I just, yeah, I would like to see that, uh, sure. the data, maybe just all of us uh, would. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to you or the author or maybe even the Secretary of State's office, 
aren't we going to run into a similar issue with the equipment that counts ballots uh, on races that are down the ballot? If we have the same problem for the presidential race at the top of the ballot, why wouldn't it apply all the way down ballot? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, program. I've, I've looked through sample ballots ahead of election, and I see them mixed throughout precincts already, uh, but they're they're by precinct. So precinct one, like I, it was me with one opponent last year. Precinct one, our names were this way, and precinct two, they were flipped, and precinct three, they were they were back around. Uh, I've seen that currently. Um, are we talking that we're we're now mixing up? every precinct and every stack of ballots within a precinct and are we going to run into the same kind of programming questions that we have at the top if i don't know who wants to answer that but if someone could mr chair yeah. um yeah. senator, senator i'll take West. a quick shot at it but then we'll let um oh you're not getting away Ms. Freeman, can up here. Come up there. um so my interest so with the presidential and vice presidential part of what we were trying to do is have a category for the major parties and then a category for minor parties and then rotate within those categories, if I have that right. And that's the part that the, the software couldn't handle. So perhaps Ms. Freeman can supplement my answer. Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Matthews. So uh, uh, that is, um, so uh, currently, uh, uh, partisan races are not rotated. Um, the order is determined based on um, how a party has performed um, previously in the last statewide election. Um, and then that order stands for um, all parties, um, for all offices, excuse me, um, throughout the state. And so uh, the order um, you know, party one, party two, party three for each office would stand for um, any partisan office. Uh, Senator Westland is correct in that um, the software is not able to do a tiered rotating system. Um, and so this, by picking by lot, um, the, the bill authors chose uh, to do that for the office of president and vice president, um, to do it in a different manner. Senator Matthews, follow up. The only one that's really changed. Then. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm trying to pull up, and it looks like you've you know, your office has already removed all of the samples uh, from last year off the website because I wanted to check. I could I could swear I've seen them different amongst precincts, because uh, I've gone looking for that with kind of that question in mind, whether it was consistent through a district or changed throughout. And then um, just I'm, I'm curious as to how that will play out logistically uh, if, if one precinct, the ballot location is going to be different at each time. It feels like it would be much more difficult to count. And we want to try to move towards faster counting in my view rather than slower counting so that's my two cents mr chair thank you senator matthews any comments senator westman no, no mr chair okay. <laughs> thank you senator Cran. thank you mr chair and uh miss freeman and also along the same section two subdivision two the rotation of names for the partisan offices that's us and so this proposal looks like it randomizes for every single ballot or rotates equally among every position. Um, each person or each candidate will rotate then through each of the positions top or f based on the number. And so that's randomized printing then. So our print, our print vendors can do that and our computer equipment can do that. Ms. Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Cran. So uh, what subdivision or section two does is uh, says that they'll be rotated in the manner um, as provided in subdivision three, which is section three. Um, and uh, that is how it, um, or no. Um, provided uh, in 204, 
excuse me, 204D.08, subdivision three, which is how we currently rotate nonpartisan races. Um, and so there is an algorithm that's in rule um, for how rotation goes. Um, it is not rotated by ballot, it's rotated by precinct. Um, and so in Minnesota, we put um, the population of, e excuse me, the red number of registered voters um, by in each precinct uh, into our ballot software. Um, and then the algorithm goes through um, to, to rotate so that there's a statistically um, equal chance uh, of, of each name being first um, based on the number of people in each precinct and how that sort of goes across, the, across a county. So um, that same county level rotation would be applied um, for any races within a county. Mr. Chair, so uh, sub Western. section two, the subdivision 2A and, um, refers back to 204D08 as the manner in which the rotation will happen. And that statutory reference says, uh, refers to primary ballots. So we're taking that as the rubric. On state primary ballots, the name of each candidate for nomination to a partisan or nonpartisan office shall be rotated with the names of the other candidates for nomination to that office so that the name of each candidate appears substantially an equal number of times at the top, at the bottom, and at each intermediate place. Um, so in other words, we do this already, and um, so this is going to be the case then um, for the general election for partisan offices. Senator Grant, follow? Um, no, I think I'm good for now. Thank you. Other questions? Are there any amendments to the bill? Any further questions? Senator Matthews, I, I think, I don't know if I can answer your question. I, you know, it does bother me that uh, you've seen that, but that could have happened, or your memory could be from the primary, because they are rotated. So that might be what you're thinking. Senator Matthews. Mr. Chair, you could be right. I was hoping uh, to pull up and look, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm disappointed that all the info is already pulled off the Secretary of State's website. So. I was hoping to check my work, hoping to confirm my accuracy, and uh, appears I'm unable to do so. Good effort, Senator Matthews. <laughs> Senator Westland, would you like to make a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I would like to move. Um, um, Mis Mr. Chair. Oh, Senator Grant. Request a roll call. Okay. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator so I'd Westland. like to move uh, um, set of file 74. 749A as amended and that it be sent to the floor. Senator Westland moves Senate file 749 as amended uh, and moved to the floor and the clerk will take the roll. Senator Carlson. Yes. Senator Westland. Yes. Senator Coran. No. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Barr. No. Senator Bolden. Yes. Senator Swadzinski. Yes. Senator Dornick. No. Senator Limmer. No. Senator Marty. Yes. Senator Matthews. No. Senator Mitchell. Yes. Senator Port, absent. Senator Rest. Yes. There being seven, seven yeas, six nays, in one absence, the uh, motion is uh, is passed. Being no more uh, more more work on our agenda here, uh, we are going to adjourn. And I think uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure that watch your email for what's going to happen in the next snow days here. Uh, the likelihood is is that we will not be meeting on Thursday. So uh, I, I hope you you're, have a safe drive home and uh, uh, make sure that you uh, 
uh, take care of yourself and your uh, trip back in. So with that, the, the meeting is adjourned. Session.